King John of England laid a heavy emphasis on loyalty, maybe because he had a lot of trouble commanding any, but there were some that he could count on. In this episode of Footnoting History, we'll be talking about John and his relationship with his most steadfast companions, his dogs. Welcome to Footnoting History, I'm your host Kristen, and today we'll be visiting the reign of one of England's most notorious kings, John, who ruled from 1199 to 1216. Many people first become familiar with John through the legend of Robin Hood. He's the bumbling, wannabe king whose greed and ineptitude were the only things stopping him from fully usurping the crown. In the Disney version, he's a thumb-sucking lion who cuddles bags of money while he sleeps. He's a poor substitute for his older brother Richard, who left England on crusade and who, quote, mother always did like best, end quote. There's a fair amount of truth to the spirit of the Disney interpretation of John. The Robin Hood stories, which were written down well over 200 years after King John lived, never actually mentioned John. But his modern biographers take care to point out John's reputation for treachery and his obsession with money. While his older brother, King Richard, was away, failing to recapture Jerusalem but trying really, really hard, and getting himself kidnapped on the way home by the Duke of Austria, John was conspiring with the French king, Philip Augustus, and marching on London with Flemish mercenaries. When John was crowned king in 1199, he proceeded pretty consistently throughout his reign to push the boundaries of royal power. Okay, so much of what John did had precedent. Richard himself rebelled against his father, Henry II, with his brothers Henry the Young King and Geoffrey, and their mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine. At one point late in the game, a young John also joined in. Some of the taxes that John sought as king were also sought by his father and by his immediate predecessor, Richard. These were known as reliefs, which were fees paid to the crown upon coming into an inheritance, or for widows who wanted to remain single after the deaths of their husbands. English kings also could collect a fee known as scutage, when their subordinates wanted to beg off of military service. Kings also sold official positions like sheriffdoms and raked in a lot of profit from royal lands and forests. They also levied general taxes that everyone had to pay. John did these things too. He just did them more, far more than his subjects felt was fair and in far greater amounts. He did this because he was trying to defend his lands in Ireland, Wales, and what is today Western and Southern France. John was always amassing men in arms for war against his one-time friend, the French King Philip Augustus, but he did not ultimately win. In fact, he lost pretty hard, which did nothing to convince the barons of England that the money had been at all worth it. There's no real way to tell if Eleanor of Aquitaine liked her son Richard Moore, as cartoon John complains in the movie. I mean, presumably at least she was fond of John when he swooped in to save her during a siege at Mirabeau, Normandy in 1202, when she was being harassed by the army of John's rival for the throne. This was John's nephew, Arthur of Brittany, who was only 15 at the time. But what he lacked in age and experience, he more than made up for in friends. Arthur had the support of the powerful Lossignon family, and the Lossignons had hated John ever since John stole Hugh de Lossignon's fiancée, Isabel of Angoulême, two years before. The chronicler Ralph of Cogsel commented that the bride, quote, seemed about 12, end quote, at the time of her Westminster Abbey coronation. Some historians think she was even younger than that. But her youth wasn't what upset John's continental allies so much. It was his dishonorable scheming to grab control of the large and strategically useful county of Angoulême, which sat between Gascony in the south and Poitou just to the north. Back in England, the barons' demands enshrined in the document now known as Magna Carta were an attempt to put John's reign back under control. The abuses of power and John's ever-growing reputation for treachery made his court a merry-go-round of changing political alliances. John was convinced people were out to get him, and he was right maybe 75% of the time. Historians debate how much of that he had coming, but the fact remains that people did often betray him, and he lived in an almost constant state of suspicion and upheaval. Maybe that's why he spent so much time with his dogs. Medieval people, like modern people, had close relationships with their dogs. They were named familiar things like Jack and Bo. An early 15th century hunting manual written by Edward the Duke of York called Master of Game gives you 1,100 options for names, including Nosewise, Amiable, Holdfast, and Sweepstake. Many people were known for spoiling their dogs with food and attention. Dogs were both companions and work colleagues. They lived in lay and monastic communities alike and provided company and affection and warmth. They guarded the home, they carried letters, they turned water wheels and rotisseries. 
Dogs also assisted in a favored medieval royal pastime, hunting. And King John reportedly loved hunting more than most. Many contemporaries commented on it, perhaps as a dig at his priorities, but in such a way as to make his love for the sport seem as a given. Dogs and their handlers were regularly part of John's retinue, and they are mentioned specifically in official letters that detail how the king's household should be provisioned on his constant travels. John's dogs hunted all over, from Ottaham in the south of England to Nottingham in the north. John was also known for sending hunting dogs to those who were, for the moment, in his good graces, in advance of royal visits. To ensure that his dogs could join him in Normandy in 1203, John sent a letter to the bailiffs of Southampton to, quote, find a good and secure ship, end quote, so that his chief forester, Hugh de Neville, could transport his dogs. Hugh was similarly charged with making sure the dogs back home in England got exercise while John was away. Dogs and hounds and puppies, as generic terms, appear a fair amount in the financial records. Greyhounds, spaniels, southern hounds, and dogs not known for barking called dogs of mota are specifically mentioned. Greyhounds show up a lot. The Exchequer, which was and is England's chief financial office, records payment after payment for dogs and their handlers and a huntsman named Furling. At one point in May of 1210, John spent 33 shillings and four pence for the expenses of 131 greyhounds and their 36 handlers for three days of hunting at Cold Mantle. Two years later, also in May, John spent 41 shillings and four pence for two days of hunting at Ditton, with a whopping 254 dogs and their 43 handlers. At 12 pence per shilling, and when an unskilled laborer could expect to make about three pence a day, this was quite a chunk of change. Really. In his biography of John, Mark Morris notes that the only type of coin in circulation at this time was a silver penny. So these were literally sacks of hundreds of silver pennies that John paid to take his dogs hunting. And in case you were wondering if these hunting expeditions were confined to the warmer seasons, they weren't. Hunting was a year-round affair that John kept up with, even in the blustery winter months. If you Google King John, you will almost certainly happen across images of John with his dogs, both of which you can see on the Footnoting History website in the entry for this episode. One image from the 14th century Statutes of England compiled for the Guildhall in London shows John on horseback hunting in the forest with his dogs. This manuscript also has a full copy of John's more famous association, the Magna Carta. Another image, also from the 14th century, shows John just hanging out with two of his dogs. One dog, which has the lean body and floppy ears of a greyhound, has popped up onto John's lap for a pet, and a happy-looking John complies. The second dog sits watchful on his other side. These images come to us well after John's death in 1216. The only image we have of John from his lifetime is the one on his great seal, which shows him on a throne and holding a sword. No dogs in sight, but probably not far from his thoughts, if we can believe medieval chroniclers and royal expenditures. Many medieval writers commented on dogs' loyalty, some dogs even laying down next to their dead humans, like the late U.S. President George H.W. Bush's service dog Sully did at Houston in late 2018. A dog's reputation for devotion was so ingrained in the Middle Ages that their images found their way onto coats of arms to signify, as one 15th century manual put it, quote, a right benign and loyal fighting man who never would leave his lord dead nor alive and is ready daily to fight for his lord, end quote. Hildegard of Bingen, the 12th century author and mystic, wrote that dogs were loving and loyal and could detect treachery against their people. Someone with a reputation for that kind of constancy and ability would have appealed to King John, who looked over his shoulder right up to the moment that he died of dysentery and or exhaustion, depending on the source you'd like to believe. By that time, John had reneged on Magna Carta, realized that a French army was besieging his castle at Windsor, and was facing a pretty grim future. It seems likely that John lost some of the crown jewels as he was trying to flee across an estuary known appropriately as the Wash. And when he finally arrived exhausted and ill at Newark Castle, John was done. He made his last will and testament, a final confession, and died one mid-October night. His effigy at Worcester Cathedral shows John with a scepter, sword, and crown, and two pocket-sized saints sitting over his shoulders. According to the Worcester Cathedral website, quote, some of John's favorite hunting grounds were near Kinver and Feckingham, end quote which were not too far from Worcester. We know that John wanted to be buried in the cathedral. He said so in his will, but he likely did not have any say in the execution of his effigy, which was created in 1232. At the stone feet of his likeness stands a small lion, which symbolized courage and strength in the medieval world. But perhaps he would have preferred one of his most steadfast companions from life. 
After one of John's Norman invasions, the chronicler William the Breton recorded him as saying that he would prefer to remain, quote, in a place safe with my dog. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.